Ok. Good night, everyone. Boa noite, todo mundo. Sejam todas bem-vindas. Welcome to the Graduate Center. It's a, it's a real honor to have you all here, especially having Tatiana here with us. Uh, I'm sorry, I think it's kind of pathetic for me to use the microphone, but we're streaming live. So we need the microphone to capture the audio for the streaming. Um, so don't get us wrong. My name is Mila Burns. I'm the Associate Director of the CLECOS, the Center for Latin American, Caribbean and Latino Studies here at the Graduate Center. I'm a professor at CUNY as well. And I like to say that CLECOS is a kind of house for all things Latin American, Latino, and Caribbean here at the Graduate Center. We welcome visiting scholars, students, researchers, uh, people with ties to the region, people who just love it for some reason or want to know more about it. Since its foundation over 20 years ago, the CLECOS has published over 110 Latino data projects, which are complex and unique quantitative studies about the Latino community in the United States. The CLECOS has awarded millions of dollars in fellowships to support students' research and work. All of our staff actually is comprised of students and former students of the Graduate Center, myself included. I did my PhD here in history. Um, and we are in different programs. So I wanted to thank all of them for the support, especially Dr. Andreina Torres Angarita, our postdoctoral fellow and the one who makes magic happen in all of our events. Kathy Cabrera Figueroa, a student in the history department who's over there and Lydia Hernandez Tapia, a student in the LILAC program. I'm thrilled to have Tatiana Salen Levy, Tatiana Salen Levy, let's say with our accent with us tonight. Tatiana is, one of the most prolific and talented writers of her generation. I would say in Brazil, but I, I would say actually around the world. Uh, hopefully you will see that with this new translation of her latest book, Vista Chinesa. And I'm gonna read what the publisher website says about the book so that I don't spoil the party for anyone because I have a tendency to do that. Uh, inspired by a real event, this is the story of a woman and a city that were violated. It is 2014, there is a euphoria in Brazil, especially in the city of Rio de Janeiro. The World Cup is about to take place and the 2016 Olympics are in sight. It is a time of hope and of frenzy construction. Julia is a partner with an architecture firm that is planning projects for the future Vila Olímpica. During the break from one of these meetings at the town hall, Julia goes for a run in Alto da Boa Vista. Suddenly, someone puts a revolver to her head, takes her to a secluded spot, and rapes her. Left abandoned in the woods, she drags herself home where her boyfriend and some family members wait for her. Vista Chinesa brings light and shadow to a city whose stunning beauty cannot conceal the most serious human and political problems. This is a novel that turns a tragic, real chapter in the story of a woman into great literature. Tatiana is also the author of House in Smyrna, also published by Scrib, which won Brazil's biggest literary award, the São Paulo Prize in Literature for a debut work. She also wrote Dois Rios and Paraíso and is the recipient of many other awards. She also wrote children's books and contributes to newspapers and short stories publications, including Granta. Tatiana thinks highly of us readers. She takes us to places that we're not sure we want to explore, that are not necessarily full of joy and wonder, but that will certainly expand our views and transform our lives. After having read all of her previous novels, I didn't expect that she could get better and better. And I think it's actually unfair to her other novels to say it's better uh, because the others have their own lives and are so beautiful. It's just that she explores more and more. She never gets tired and neither do we readers. We keep wanting more. So I'm glad that we'll have more with Tatiana here with us. Let's start this conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Let's give a round of applause just for having Tatiana here with us. Go for it. <laughs> uh, good evening and thank you very much for coming here. And thank you, Mila, for the invitation mm -hmm. and all these uh, beautiful words. Um, I'm sorry, but my English is not very good. It's been a long time, I don't speak it, but <laughs> I'll try. And if I, if I can't say something, Mila will help me. Yeah. Um, so I start talking 
Yeah, well, you can start however you want. I was just thinking if we could maybe start first to start slowly and smoothly talking about the translation itself, uh, because I always feel like translations are tough, especially for authors. And um, knowing that you have your first novel is so personal. And although this one is not personal, personal, it is sort of personal because the real story is of a friend of yours. So how do you see and you can see when reading both novels, all the care that you put into choosing every single word there. Translating it means that every single word is not gonna be there. So how does it feel for you to see the novel in English? In English, it's a great pleasure because I'm very lucky. I have a very good translator who is Alison Entrecky. She's now uh, translating Grande Sertão Veredas. That's a, a very important Brazilian a book, a novel, and very uh, of a very difficult translation. Um, and I always say to her that um, my books are better in English <laughs> than in Portuguese. Uh, I'm not sure for Vista Chinesa, but for the house in Smyrna, I'm sure because um, we changed some uh, some things. Uh, she suggested me. Uh, some modifications that I really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> uh, for Vista Chinesa, uh, I'm very glad with her work also. And we always talk a lot, a lot during the, the translation mm -hmm. process. Uh, it also works like this for Spanish, for example, but it's not always like this, but in English, it works very well. And also, uh, the editor uh, gave some opinions, but this time I was very sure about what I did, and I and I didn't change anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in both cases, in 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 the House of Smyrna, the two translated versions, the cities, the places that you explore, are almost as important as human characters to the story. In Rio de Janeiro, in the case of Vista Chinesa, you can read it as a novel about violation, as I said, of a woman and a violation of a city and a city's uh, identity and structure and everything, just like you can you can put that side by side with the human uh, violence. Um, how does that play for you? Is it is it that is it that is that the case? Can we include the city or the location as an extra character or it's it's not necessarily that they are just in conversation and you know setting the ambiance of what's going on there now uh of uh, Vista, in the case of vista chinesa uh chinesa uh, the city is a character in the beginning uh, it was not i i didn't think about it but when i because can i tell a little bit about the the story Do of you the mind? Book. No, right. Okay. No, no. <laughs> uh, so one of my best friends was raped when in 2014 in Vista Chinesa. That's uh, a very famous touristic place in Rio de Janeiro. It's a very beautiful place in, in the middle of the forest. We have there's a great view from there. Uh, and 2014 was the year where when Brazil had the World Cup mm -hmm. and Rio was preparing itself to to host uh, the Olympic Games. So worldwide, Rio de Janeiro was being told as the, the a magical place, the perfect place to be. And at that time, my friend uh, was raped. And some months later, I asked her if I could write about this story, and she she said yes. But uh, it took long uh, for me to really decide to write the book. So I wrote it in 2018. And when I wrote the novel, uh, Rio de Janeiro was uh, a completely different city. It was after uh, World Cup and after Olymp the Olympic Games. Um, and it was uh, f for the political uh, background, it was everything was very hard to Brazil and especially to Rio, I think. So it, it was much more violent and all that we imagine it will it would change in Rio, it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
when I uh, when I started uh, writing, it was impossible not to put all these changes uh, in the city. And I started thinking um, about the city, uh, uh, the story of the city, the history of the, the city, actually, um, how it was also uh, violated. And thinking also about the forests, mm -hmm. because the forests is being destroyed in Rio, in Amazon, as you know, etc. And um, and the vocabulary we use uh, for the forest, it's uh, kind of the same vocabulary we use for um, women's violence. So, or, or the women's body. Also, we say that a virgin forest. I don't know if you say that virgin forest. In English? Yeah, you can say a pristine, uh, but yeah, but the word is the same. I think we can use that. I think so, Virgin Islands, we use that. Yeah, so we use Virgin Forest, and then we say desbravar, uh, I don't know how to say it. Explore? Say, yeah. Unearth but, somehow? Yeah, yeah. The, the, there's a vocabulary that's used. Sexualized. That's sexualized. And uh, um, so I started thinking about uh, how Brazil uh, raped uh, uh, Brazilian women and Brazilian forest. So of course it's a novel, so it's not a, a book about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but because of it, uh, Rio became uh, a character, mm -hmm. a, a kind of main character. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I don't want to go crazy here, but just to say that I think of Maria Mies and many other feminist authors who, who do the comp this comparison and say that women are the last colony, basically, the last colony to be exploited and all the similarities between colonialism and the exploitation of the female body um, and even the Pachamama and all the legal discussions of that. And I'm going to say something that I didn't tell you in person uh, because I don't want you to feel like I was sneaking. But when I was at your place um, two summers ago, and I spent some weeks at Tatiana's house while she was away. She lives in Lisbon and kindly uh, uh, let her stay in her place. And in the outside area, there's, um, there's an area full of books that are not books in that outside area where we eat, the big table. Oh, okay. yeah, in the, yeah, in the apartment. And, uh, and I was looking at the shelf with books and there were so many books about criminal justice and understanding the legislation that goes around rape and all that. And I was just thinking, now that you mentioned um, this invasion of the forest and all that, um, how does the research take place? Because for me, thinking of as someone who never wrote a novel, I, I only write nonfiction books. Um, I always envision this image of a novelist sitting down and inspiration coming and it just, <laughs> Right, and there you go. Or maybe you listen to your friends uh, reporting a narrative of what happened to her, her memories and all of that, and you write. And then when I saw that, I said, oh my. So there's a lot of work in terms of even understanding the legislation and the legal system around that. So you said you wrote in 2018, and I was Googling when you said the date, that's the year when the Harvey Weinstein scandal happened, took place here. So to what extent you go search for things like the legal system, legislation, how far you go in your research, and to what extent current events uh, inform what you're writing? So I always make some research, but uh, not that much mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, for fiction books mm -hmm. that's very different because I also write nonfiction books. Um, in this case, uh, it was mainly based on my on the interviews I made with my friends. So this was uh, the main work mm -hmm. before writing. So uh, I interviewed her uh, several times, but I also made the research about um, how the process goes in the, because there's a, a, a important part of the novel that's uh, the investigation. Um, so uh, I made the research about it and a lot about the Retrat Falat. I don't know how to mm, how do you say. say that. Like the process of trying Retrat to make Falad. a portrait of the criminal. How do you say that in English? Uh, profile? The profile. Yeah. yeah. So. Thank you. I researched a lot about it, how how to make a profile mm -hmm. and things like this. 
Um, and I, I was doing kind of some small research mm -hmm. about the Olympic Games, um, about corruption during the mm -hmm. Olympic Games. So there's a little bit about it. Um, and also because Julia, who is the main character, she's an architect and she's working for the Olympic Games. She's uh, building the um, golf, mm -hmm. I don't know how to say, yeah. <laughs> golf course. Go course. <laughs> uh, so I did this research. I talked to some, uh, to the architects who did mm -hmm. it uh, effectively. So um, to understand how it works, because mm -hmm. I don't play golf. I don't know <laughs> <laughs> uh, how it's a golf course. So. I had to study a little bit about it. Uh, but it, it's a process. In this case, I had the, the, the interviews before and I started writing. Mm -hmm. And during the, during the writing, uh, I started the other researchers. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that I make a big research before and mm -hmm. then I write, which is different uh, from a nonfiction book. That's fascinating. And you also mentioned that she talked to her multiple times, not only when it happened, you being a friend of hers, but while writing the book. Um, many specialists in violence against women uh, say that actually in Brazil, they were attempting to do that. I don't know for how long it lasted to record the whatever that the, when they're they're sharing what happened uh, or witnesses or all of that once so that they don't have to go over and revisit the situation over and over again, because you revisit the violence, you live the violence over and over again. And, uh, and I was wondering uh, to what extent these conversations with you were revisiting the violence, uh, how emotional it was for her, because I also read um, in many interviews at the time of the book launch in Brazil that it was quite releasing at the same time for her to put that in a book. Um, especially in communicating that with her kids. Mm -hmm. So how was that part of this emotional process in terms of reconciling, revisiting violence, and at the same time, living it as a necessary memory? Uh, I think it was uh, very different from the moment, for example, when she lived it, and then um, because of the investigation, she had to retell it several times, because. Mm -hmm. Brazil policy is kind of mm -hmm. <laughs> particular. So um, she had to retell the story uh, several times. Uh, every time she, wa uh, she went to, to the police station to, to check if uh, suspected was uh, or not the, the raper, raper, rapist. rapist. Um, and this was very difficult for her uh, to tell several times. Mm -hmm. But when I did the interviews, it was uh, four years after uh, the, the rape. <clears throat> and I was very impressed and as how she told me, because she really wanted to mm -hmm. tell me. Um, and it, everything was very vivid in her memory. She knew every detail um, because we talked a lot about it when it happened. And she talked about it with other friends, with her family. Uh, but later, uh, everyone stopped talking about it because, because of that. You don't want to, to make the person to go to the story again. So, so for four years, I, I've never asked her again about what happened mm -hmm. <clears throat> until the moment I decided to write the book. And that's when um, I knew that uh, she thought about it uh, every day, about every, everything about the rape, every, every, every single day. Um, and then I realized that, that it was not only memory, but something that she lived uh, every day. <clears throat> and she really 
she really wanted to talk about it. So sometimes uh, after the conversation, during this process, uh, she recorded, she, she remembered something and she recorded a met because I was in Lisbon and she was in Rio de Janeiro. So um, the interviews were by phone uh, and I recorded mm -hmm. all of them, of course. And sometimes she, she sent me voice message on WhatsApp saying, oh, I, there was this and this and this, also this. And uh, during the process, uh, she knew it would be a novel and not a book about her, about mm -hmm. her story. But at the end, when the book was ready, uh, she read the book. And then she asked me to put her name because uh, she thought it, would, it was very different to say that it was based on a true story or uh, this is the story of this person. This person mm -hmm. To give uh, a face to the story, a body to the story. So, um, and she also gave, she gave only one interview, but she gave one interview with me when I launched the book there. And she's, um, uh, she's a filmmaker, but actually she's, she works for television. She makes mm -hmm. series and soap operas, but she wants to make uh, also movies and she's going to film it. Yeah. Film. And it's interesting because it's her story, but she's going to film the uh, Julia's story. Uh, the, the novel. Mm -hmm. And of course, the novel, it's not only based on reality. There are many things that didn't happen to her. Mm -hmm. so. Besides the project of her filming it, there's a play now about the novel. So this adaptation, did you take part of it? How did you feel about seeing it as a play? And is this part of the process of turning it into a series too? Uh, no, I didn't take part. I don't <laughs> like to take part. <laughs> uh, once I finish a book, it's done for me. So um, I don't want, I don't like to, to go back to mm -hmm. this, even if it's to do in, in another way. So uh, it was, um, it's a monologue. So it's a it's a couple who work who works together for each play, um, and it's a, I think it's a very beautiful play. Uh, they did it very well. So and for the for the movie because I'm very friend with Joana, mm -hmm. I of course I read the script the script and uh, I give my opinion things like that mm -hmm. as as she does for my all my novels. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's, fa that's a fascinating process for you and for her, I can imagine. I was wondering, too, if the fact that you conducted the interviews uh, from a distance and by phone, if you can imagine if that affected the result of that somehow, because I keep thinking of people like Terry Gross, who interviews people uh, from her studio in Philadelphia and wherever you are, and those are the best interviews, in my opinion, by a journalist in the United States, or I won't remember his name, but one of the most important documentary makers in the US that does the interview with that cover that he doesn't see the interviewee, it's gonna come up. Okay. We're, we're doing this on the flow, everyone. So I didn't take note of the names, but he makes a point, he built this box so that he can interview the interviewee from a distance. And, they, and his movies are mostly about war, corruption, so touchy topics. Uh, do you think that that has helped? Was on purpose? Was it on purpose or? No, it was not on purpose. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, you were far, that, so I was, that was the only I way. was in Lisbon and she was in yeah. Rio. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question because I've never uh, thought about it before. Uh, maybe the book would be different if <laughs> the interview were personally. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know. I really don't know. I But we are very... We are very close friends and um, we are very similar in a way that uh, she was she was a journalist before mm -hmm. she's she started journalism and she's a person who uh, loves to ask uh, so she asks everyone uh, about anything everything and I do the same uh, I'm very yeah, I remember the first time we met and you were like, why do you like this dish? 
how so how did it yeah. like who is this woman <laughs> asking me all these questions <laughs> yes so i love making questions <laughs> i love knowing about uh, everyone's lives so <laughs> and joana is exactly the same so she understands me mm -hmm. so i could make her any question i had in my mind so there was no censorship in this so this was very important for the book and I, I think she was very comfortable to because we have this. I don't have this specific relationship with all my friends, mm -hmm. but I have it with her. So that's fascinating. Maybe that played a role too in you thinking that that was a story that needed to be told. So I just want to ask you my last question so that we can open for questions from the audience and have enough time for that. Can you talk us a little bit about your next projects if you have anything inside? Uh, Yes, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> uh, now it's um, because all my books, that's very, that's very funny. All my novels, I start uh, writing in third person. Do you, do you, and say? you end up writing in first and person. And I end up <laughs> <laughs> writing in first person. Um, and, and then I now recently I found out that it happens with a lot of women writers. Uh, Elena Ferrand, she told uh, that in her, um, she did some lectures in mm -hmm. uh, Italian University in Bologna mm -hmm. and it was published, it was probably published here also, but I read it in, in Portuguese. And she also said that, um, and, uh, and there are some other writers, women writers mm -hmm. who say that. And now I'm writing in first <laughs> person, uh, and I am the I am uh, the character. The, I am the character. Uh -huh. It's so it's an autobiography mm -hmm. uh, story. Mm, I'm in a way I'm revisiting uh, my relationship with my mother. That is very um, explored in my first novel. Mm -hmm. uh, she died twenty four years ago, so it's. Uh, it, but I'm also working with um, some material uh, she wrote. So she, when she was a teenager, she gave, uh, she wrote two diaries, mm -hmm. diaries, yeah, say, yeah. journals. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And um, when I was a teenager, she gave me her diaries. Mm -hmm. So, and these diaries, they were lost for more than 20 years. And my sister found them uh, last year. Actually, I was writing about the diaries I had, but I hadn't anymore. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I was red writing when my sister found oh. them. So it's a lot about this. Um, it's act actually it's a kind of uh, novel uh, mixed with essay about uh, women's writing first person and the relationship with with diaries, with journals, mm -hmm. and... Um, so now that you have the diaries, do you think it's gonna turn into an autobiography, but a sort of biography of hers too? Uh, Is her mm, voice gonna be there? No, yes, the, okay. the, uh, I will publish some of her mm -hmm. uh, diary there, um, but it's more about our relationship mm -hmm. than and the relationship of it with, with literature and it's funny because uh, today I was in some bookshops and I found a lot of uh, books like in in the way I'm writing so mm -hmm. I think something that's in the air <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that I think that a lot of women are writing about yeah and, and you're right I think some yeah. of the best recent novels that we have including um uh, first novels like by women writers are, are written in the first person and have this effect as well. That's that's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. I, I think the name of the filmmakers is Errol Morris. I think I was referring to him, but I'll Google it later. So the floor is open. If you want to ask questions, uh, the mic is here and Andreina is going to be facilitating that. So let's do this. Hi, 
Um, so I have several questions. I, I wanted to know, um, first of all, what, what happens, not so much in the book, because I, I don't know if you should reveal what happens in the book, but um, to her. So what eventually um, happened to her and uh, did they catch the rapist? Um, and I also wanted to know a little bit about how rape is seen in Brazil because um, rape um, is seen differently in different countries. Um, and, and we've changed here the way we see rape versus let's say 30, 40, 50 years ago, thankfully. Um, so there's a lot of stigma to it. Um, in many, many countries, there's still stigma to it here, much less, thank God. But, um, you know, for example, um, people don't want to reveal their names, et cetera, et cetera. So this is very brave of her. Um, so I, I just wanted to know a little bit more about that. Thank you. Uh, but the first question was uh, what happened to her and but in which moment? Maybe um, Ah, okay, after after the rape, you mean? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think it's impossible to overrate it. So, uh, she and she knows it, and I think it's important to know it. That it's something that we um, she will live with for the rest of her life. Uh, but in a way, she 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 said in in this interview that. Um, she's less, uh, she has less joy. Uh, but if you see her, she's a very beautiful woman and you would say she's very happy. And uh, well, she married after this and she had two children. Um, so she, I think she has a good life, but this is a trauma. So um, in a way it's, she says it's, it's on her body, but on her soul, uh, it changed her uh, forever, I think. But she, she did uh, a lot of uh, psychoanalysis and things like this. And, and this is very specific uh, because she's a middle class um, uh, woman in Brazil. Because most of the rapes in Brazil, uh, they happen uh, with poor women. Uh, with black women, uh, so it's, um, it's and it's much more difficult for them to have the support. So she has a, a very special support. Uh, it's a still a stigma in Brazil. Uh, I think it's been changed for the last years. But when I published the book, uh, I did something with. Um, it's kind of uh, me too in Brazil. Uh, what's your name? Alice? Oh, I forgot. Antonia Pellegrino que saiu aqui. Agora que são elas. Yeah, I translate. Agora que são elas. I don't know. How to... <laughs> it's a, yeah. So we did something together uh, because they have a lot of followers in Instagram, uh, Twitter, etc. So we talked about the book and we opened a, a space for women to talk privately with us about uh, their own rapes. And there was like three women uh, who told it. Uh, and then uh, and she asked it not to put their names. So it's something that uh, it's very hardly spoken in Brazil. Um, it's still very, very difficult. But I, I had a lot of message um, from readers who were raped and Joana even more, because I think they identify themselves with the victim and, and that. And, but I had I had a lot also, so 
but not from the program because the, this this thing with Agora Exxon Elas, we wanted to make something with it to publish or to talk about it um, publicly, publicly, openly. Um, so I think that's why there were only three women, and but privately they can uh, say more. But they also. Uh, they always ask me not to tell or not to, to tell their names. So it's still a stigma. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 it was very, it uh, was very impossible. Uh, it was almost impossible to, to find him in, in Brazil, in Rio. Yes. Yes. Um, you have some uh, uh, some books or several books written. I want to know this subject is very traumatic, no? very difficult. Do you have uh, this? Um, you have a special way to, or you would need to change the, the, you, the way you write because of this, or is, did you feel that's different? I want to know the, your process of the writing of this traumatic uh, episode. I actually I write a lot about trauma. I think all, all my books talk about trauma, so uh, that's also why I wanted to tell. This story in the way I told it because it's um, she she tells the story uh, in the novel five years after uh, the rape and it's a letter to her children uh, so I'm always thinking uh, I'm also thinking about um, she's the the character is thinking about how um, this trauma will pass through generations. And this is something that appears in almost, oh, not all, because I think dois reis, maybe not. Um, but in three of my novels, uh, this is this is central. So I don't think I really change it, uh, my way of writing to to tell the story, but. Um, it, it was probably the hardest uh, novel for me to write, not, be, not exactly because of the subject, but um, because of the, the a forma, how do you say forma? A forma, yes. Um, because usually when you're going to write about uh, something that has no words to describe, like, uh, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> no, indivisible, indivisible, like un unspeakable, something that is unspeakable. Yes, yes, yes. So usually we talk about it, write, we write about it, uh, not telling. Um, straight directly what happened but we try to find a, a, a way to um, yes um, but when I did the interviews my friend gave me uh, so many details that I thought no I I can't ignore it you know I can simply I cannot uh, write tell, really tell uh, how was um, the, the violation. So this was very difficult because um, in a way it's easier not to tell it in literature because if you simply uh, tell it, maybe it will be kind of journalistic and it won't make the effect you want to make in, in the reader. 
so it won't be emotionally or it was too sometimes when it's uh, when you show too when you show too much it uh, it loses the, this effect so i had to find a way of telling it of not ignoring the details she gave me uh, but in a very um, literary way Because we're screaming. <laughs> uh, no, I was just curious. I don't know if you mentioned this before. How did the name came about? Or is there any connection in terms of the name of the book? Uh, it, it's the place where she was raped. It's Vista Chinesa. It's a touristic place in, in Rio de Janeiro. It's the name of it. Uh, in the middle of the forest, where, uh, and there's a great view from there. So it's like, you know, uh, Corcovado, it's where there's the, the Christ in Rio de Janeiro. So Vista Chinesa, it's like a sugar loaf. Sugar loaf. Okay. So like it's a. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. It's, it's okay. less known. It's less known, but it's a tourist place in Rio. But I find it, your question fascinating because it surprised me that they kept the title in English. But they kept the title in every, every, right? er, every language. Because it's uh, the Spanish editor uh, tried to find uh, a different title. Uh, we tried to do it together, but we we simply <laughs> couldn't do it. And um, it's the name of the place. So, and the, my translator told me that it's, it's um, being more usual to keep uh, the original title not to translate depending of course depending on the day but so chinese view that there wouldn't be yeah. no <laughs> and i was also curious to know uh, at what point did she share this the, you know this situation or what happened with you and was it at the time also that i guess it was before she had had children right that this happened i assuming so I was just curious at what point she shared it with you. And I know it took a few years for you to write about it, but you know, to, to write this thing, but you know, when did she share it with you? I think she, she shared me a lot uh, with... Um, when? When? Uh, at the time when it happened, she told me as a friend. And then uh, I made several interviews in 2018, I think. Yeah, it, I wrote it in 2018 and 2019. Actually, when this is an interesting story also, because uh, when I decided to write the novel in 2000, in the beginning of 2015, uh, like one month later, I I discovered that I was pregnant. I was pregnant of my my first child, uh, who is uh, is a boy. It's a boy, and then I I decided not to write about it because I thought that to write about a rape, being pregnant, uh, it would be very hard for me, and I was afraid. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that the trauma will go to also to my son. <laughs> and then I said, no, uh, I won't write about it now. I wait. So, and then there was pregnancy and uh, breath, uh, breast, breastfeeding. And I waited and I said, no, not now. And then I started writing uh, another novel that's not finished. Yet. Um, and in 2018, uh, I got pregnant again and from a girl uh, and it's when I decided to write uh, the novel uh, so I wrote this this novel during my pregnancy and my the, the, and the breastfeeding so it, it was exactly the time it was two years so um, and 
I always say that I wrote it uh, with her. So she was writing it with me because I think that the notice that it was a girl also made me uh, write this novel. Um, and sometimes a friend asked me, ah, what, what's your novel about? And I said, uh, and I said, it's about a rape. And I was with, uh, <laughs> and everyone uh, thought I was crazy. Uh, but actually it gave me uh, strongness to, to write it. Um, I, and also to think about um, her, my friend's pregnancy uh, because uh, geographically in the body, it's the same place. No, so uh, and she was pregnant of twins, but two boys. Uh, so when I was pregnant, writing the novel, I started to think uh, how it was for her uh, to be to be pregnant uh, after uh, the rape, uh, and also I started to think if the the twins, in a way, they knew. Um, about it in in uh, cells memory, I would say, so, because if she, I thought if she uh, she lives it every day, she thinks about it every day. Um, so probably the boys uh, know something without knowing. So that's why I decided to write the letter. And when Joana asked me to put her name. Uh, I told her, but you know that putting your name, you were telling, because of course they don't know because they are five years old, so the, uh, they don't know. Uh, but I told her, but it's, you know, you were telling them when they they grow up, they will know, they, one day they read it, so they will know. And she told me, but uh, uh, that's the mother they have. I want them uh, to know, so. Well, thank you so much for this talk. And I'm, I feel like I'm learning so much and I really appreciate you coming and sharing your uh, perspective. But yeah, you mentioned it a little bit like throughout, but you said you also write nonfiction. So I'm just, and it seems like a lot of your fiction though is very personal, autobiographical, like you're gonna be writing about your mother. So I wonder how you choose, like what stories you think are like worthy of a novel or something, or like should be literary and told in that way versus nonfiction and what do you think is kind of the like how do you view kind of the contribution of like the novel if that makes sense to those stories and then I also wonder if because you also mentioned like women's writing and obviously this is it seems like a very feminist text so I'm wondering like how do you it might be a weird question but how do you see yourself fitting into like the tradition of like Brazilian women's literature like or like Brazilian women writers and um yeah, if you have any thoughts on that, just because like I know my favorite author is um, like Clarice Lispector, <laughs> which who's very different. I know, I know, but I just wonder, um, yeah, how you how you see yourself in that kind of tradition, but also as someone who comes from like also a different diverse background than maybe the majority of Brazilians. So yeah, if you have any thoughts on that, thank you. Well, my nonfiction books are not novels, so they are actually more academic, so it's a different subject, or um, uh, my chronicles in the, um, in the newspapers. So I always publish it as, uh, as a book. Um, Clary, it's impossible to be a woman writer in Brazil and not to, <laughs> to talk with Clarice. <laughs> we have to talk with her uh, all the time, so. Uh, of course, when she was, when I, when I first read her, I was like 13 years old, uh, and I was astonished. With, and my whole um, adolescence, I was, I wanted to be her, you know. <laughs> so, but I think, I think it happened with not all, but almost all uh, Brazilian uh, women writers. Um, but now I think it's uh, it's being 
very different because there are a lot of women writing and pub publishing because I think they used it to write but not to be published and now they are being published. Uh, so I think it, it will be different for the, the next generation. But I was, um, another day I was, no, no, <laughs> but now they will be, they will have a very wide, uh, <laughs> uh, they, they will have a lot of possibilities. So. <laughs> um, but uh, another day I thought that, of course, I love uh, a lot of male writers uh, who are very fundamental for me, but I never wanted to be one of them. I never wanted to write as they write. I always, in my whole life, I wanted to be Gladys Lispector or Virginia Woolf or <laughs> Catherine Manson. I don't know. The, always, uh, always women. Uh, so I identify myself uh, a lot with other uh, women writers. It was not as it was fiction, no, 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 okay. Uh, you mentioned that you were writing while, while pregnant with your mm -hmm. first, so basically that you could have finished that one. No, but I yeah. I curious when I heard that. I'm like, are you going back to that? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, <laughs> it's a, a very funny story with this novel because I've been writing it for 12 years. And <laughs> but then I published different uh, novels, and um, the problem is that when I fish, finish one of these novels and I go back to the other, I I restart writing. Oh, so <laughs> I have uh, a lot of versions. So I think I will never finish it. <laughs> but my project is when when I finish finish this autobiographic um, or this nonfiction uh, novel. Uh, I want to go back to that novel. <laughs> I'm trying to finish it. But um, how I pick up, I think it, um, for me, it has to be very um, personal, um, not necessarily about my life, but um, I have to be touched about it. So the this novel is not about me. It's about uh, Joana's story. And of course, there's also... Uh, a lot of uh, fiction on it, but sh she's very she's a very close friend, so it's something that um, disturbed me. Um, but sometimes, for example, my second novel uh, that's not autobiographic, I, I never say at all because <laughs> there's always something. Um, I decided to write because of the places, so it's a novel. That's set in Ilha Grande, that's a big island, and uh, he, it's an island in Rio de Janeiro, and in Corsica, uh, in France, uh, and and I have um, uh, a passion about islands, so I wanted to write about islands, and then I created story to write about these two islands. <laughs> so. But the, these islands are personal for me. I think we can have one more question or two if you want, because we started a little late. However you feel like. Anyone else wants to? You can ask the questions in Portuguese, too, if you prefer. Também podem perguntar em português, se preferirem. Como quiserem. No? Yeah? Eu sou Geraldo Nunes, não sei se você está lembrado, Ilha. Ah, excuse me. Ah, eu, eu queria saber que você contasse um pouco, eu não sei se contou porque eu cheguei atrasado, é, quando que você resolveu que você ia escrever o que você escreveu no livro? Em que momento? Da, enfim, você contou um pouco aí, eu peguei no meio, mas seria interessante... Enfim, como é que você 
conseguiu articular um, uma, uma lógica na sua cabeça que você projetou a possibilidade de, de fazer o livro. Escrever. Okay. So, to give a different answer. <laughs> you can just... <laughs> um, uh, it happened with Joana in August of uh, 2014. Uh, and in Mar uh, March of the following year, uh, I went to Paris because there was... Um, oh, no. Homage? Homage? Um, homage to Brazil. Uh, um, no, it was not Brazil year in France. It was um, for for the book fair. Okay. Brazil was the the man. Yes. So there were a lot of Brazilian writers there, and I went to a, an exhibition uh, of uh, an American uh, photographer. Uh, now I forgot her name, of course, <laughs> but I can I I find him. His, his, I have the book. Uh, when I decided to write the novel. When and why? And, uh, uh, Taryn Simon. I don't know if I say like this. Taryn? What was the last next novel? Taryn. Taryn Simon. Uh, she's an American photographer uh, from my generation. Um, and there was a big exhibition uh, on her in this uh, in Paris. Uh, and a part of it, it was uh, some portrait uh, she made um, of people who were on, uh, on jail, on jail, in, uh, in jail. <laughs> No, had been. had been in jail, uh, but they were innocent. And sometimes they spent almost all their lives there. And in, gen in, in general, of course, they were black or indigenous or Latin American. They were, they were not white people. Um, and one of, more than one, I think, uh, of them were um, accused from uh, from of of rapists, um, and uh, there was uh, and there were some testimonies from the victims. And one one woman who was raped, uh, she told that uh, she accused him because uh, when she saw uh, the photo. Um, the photo uh, of the of the guy, uh, but she never saw the guy. She saw only the photo, <clears throat> and the photo uh, remembered her of the reminded her of the. Um, lembrança que ela tinha do homem. Reminded her of the memory of, of the man. Of the man. Uh, but. That everything was very fluid, and also she saw that the police was. Um, sometimes the police here can be similar to yeah. police in Brazil as well. So uh, they are trying to. Um, they wanted to to close the case, so they wanted to find someone. Uh, in most of these cases, was like this, <laughs> and then because of it, I remember. Uh, I. Re I remember about, I'm sorry, after an hour, the English is worse than <laughs> the beginning. Um, and then I remembered about the investigation, about what happened with uh, Joana and her case, because it was like this. The police wanted to put uh, someone in jail, arrest someone, uh, of course, because she was white, she worked in Globo, uh, that's a big television in Brazil. So uh, they was they were all the time trying to to make her to say yes, this is the guy. Um, and she was very. Um, 
yes, to push at her. And when I saw these photos, I realized that what could uh, have happened if she said, yes, this is the, this is the guy. And at this day, I, I thought, uh, maybe I, I have a novel here because there's the investigation that's uh, real and everything. So this was the first moment, I think, when I... And there are passages in the book when she says, that the character, Julia, says, you're forcing me to, rec to think, to point towards this guy because he's black or because he looks a certain way. Was that part of the real story? Yes, yes. No, story? yes, it was real. Um, and even for the um, portrait, uh, they tried to make her, because he was not black, he was white. Uh, uh, and they tried to, to do, uh, and he was white, and several times when she went to the police station, there was a black guy. Uh, Tatiana, I will be here for three months more. What do you think? I wait to read the book in Portuguese or I do it in English? <laughs> uh, this is a very different question. <laughs> I think I can borrow you my copy of Portuguese. <laughs> yeah. But you have to give me back. <laughs> yes, yeah, but it. If you are Brazilian, you are Brazilian, so read it in Portuguese, of course. <laughs> but uh, for those who want to read it in English, the translation is excellent. So. <laughs> no, it, it will be it will be published in May because it was published in the UK. Uh, it's it's done. We have the book, <laughs> but. You can pre-order, so you can pre-order. Pre-order is good. <laughs> we should have thought of you. Yeah. Yeah. We messed up. Yeah. We messed it up. So thank you all so much for coming. It was a joy having you all here. Uh, always feel welcome to our events. We have a bunch of them. Follow us on Instagram. Twitter, uh, Twitter still exists, it does, right? <laughs> Twitter, Facebook, we're everywhere so that you can know, you know, about our events. Tatiana is also online and also always publishing what she's doing, where she is. She will be at Princeton, Harvard and Brown in the next few days. So in case one of you is around, she will be talk giving talks in all these other places. And again, thank you so much for coming and thank you so much. Muito obrigada, this was amazing. <laughs>